First on the agenda, are there any changes or additions, Dan? Yes, um, one I'd like to add, just an update on the storm damage, let Kevin update the select board on what's going on out there. Yeah. And number two, I'd like to, to delete rejoining LCPC. Hmm. Hmm, how come? Um, I was requested by a member. We're not, We're not prepared. prepared to discuss I'm here. Sorry, Jim. I didn't, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Summer. Okay. Next, approve the minutes. The minutes of October 21st, 2019. So moved. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So pass. Next, community concerns. <coughs> Selena Howard Nichols has. Who's here to speak about that? This was really an update, you know, at the beginning of the budget cycle. The board asked us to have some of them come in and update um, the nonprofits okay. for the yeah. appropriations. So yes. that's what this is to explain what they're doing. And we're set up on a cycle now, I think, for every five years to have somebody in front of the board, at, as what we discussed last year after town meeting. I think we picked five. We picked five. Yeah. So like right now. We'll move to the next one now. Central Vermont Adult Basic Education. That's me, I'm Brian Kravitz, the Development and Outreach Coordinator. How are you doing? Well, oh, thanks. So, what, what, what do you want? Well, I can give you, uh, I have some literature I can hand out. Just take a look. Thank you. Um, CDABE has been, oh, let me get this. And I'll leave a couple extra. Thank you. We have been serving um, Lomoel County for adult education for, fit, well, 55 years, uh, come 2020. Um, our learning center is right across the street, just above Kaplan's. Um, we, last year, served 29 Morrisville residents in, in the learning center. Um, we also, as a whole, the learning center served 128 students, which means that we're bringing, you know, we're bringing people into town. Um, we really do four, we have four uh, things that, our main things that we do. Basic literacy, reading, writing, math, and computers. Uh, the second is high school credentialing, either a high school diploma or a GED. The third is English language learning and citizenship for the uh, new Americans. And the last, and this is the big one that people don't really know, is um, career and college readiness. Um, when I go out and talk to people, I say, you know, people don't really know this, but we can work with people with high school diplomas. And people go, wow, I had no idea that you could do that. Absolutely, just because someone has a high school diploma doesn't mean that they're ready for um, a career or the career that they want. It doesn't mean someone at any age might say, wow, you know, I really want to go back to take some classes at CCB, and, but I'm really worried. I haven't written a paper since high school, and that was 25 years ago. Well. Don't take the class. Come to us. We'll help you work on those skills. Um, you know, everything from computer literacy, which is really important. Um, we have a lot of elderly students now. People coming in saying, you know, I have grandkids. I want to I wanna FaceTime them or whatever that is. And get, I don't even know how to turn on a computer. So we start with them from the beginning. And uh, that's really the basis of what we do. We try to really look at it in two different domains. Life, how are we going to affect your life and family? That, you know, the, the basic, that reading, writing, math, for a lot of our students, that's the stuff that, that was hard for them in high school. That was the reason why maybe they didn't, um, if they graduated, whether they graduated or not, that might be the reason, that was the trigger. That was whatever it was that was hard for them. It could be, it could have been, um, family circumstances, it could have been mental illness, it could have been uh, teenage pregnancy. There's a thousand reasons why people didn't learn and they didn't achieve in high school and that's what we're here to do is to help them as they get in later life, 16 and up, how can we, you know, what can we do? And we're really goal oriented. We work with every person who comes in to say, hey, what's your goal? Well, my goal is 
to be able to, you know, I want to be able to re read to my grandkids. I'm taking care of my grandkids now, and I couldn't read to my own kids, and I want to read to my grandkids. That's something that's happening more and more, um, especially in Vermont. Thousands of grandparents are now the primary care providers for their for their kids, and it's generational. Um, amazing. 82, there's an 82% higher chance if a parent has low literacy for their kids to have low literacy. Mm -hmm. Over 70% higher chance if a parent didn't graduate from high school, their 70% chance that their kids will not graduate from high school. It's generational. And um, you know, that's our goal is to get people what they need. So that's my quick and easy. <laughs> How do people find out? Um, Especially the um, career in college. How do people find out about that? So I do. We do extensive outreach. Um, you know, a lot of it is the direct outreach to potential students is really tough, as you can imagine, because people hear school and that's that trigger. Like I know I need it, but I'm afraid of it. Um, it's like a public service advertisement. People have to hear it from a thousand. You know, they hear it on the radio. So we do radio advertising. Um, we then we do exclusive radio advertising in Morrisville on um, LVB. Um, so we do, as well as the other stations, um, we work with, with the mental health agencies. The counselors <coughs> all know who we are. Um, at so Lamoille at the Family Center, they all know who we are. At um, uh, parole and probation, or you know Lamoille um, Restorative Justice, we work with them. Those are. I call them the refers. Those are the people who have already have um, relationships with our potential students. That when they hear it from a couple of other people, and then they hear it from friends, then they start coming in. I'll say our our Morrisville Learning Center is busy as busy can be. We're our staffing's 2.6 FTE. We could have three or four people here. It, this is it's just a you know booming learning center. So, um, the outreach is a huge part. How much was the appropriation for them last year? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Twenty-nine hundred. Uh, is there any request for an increase to that this nope. year? No, we're, we're requesting level funding. We've been asking about that for quite a while. And what? Where else do you get your funding? Okay, <laughs> we get. Um, a hunk of it comes from state and federal grants through the Agency of Ed and Department of Ed. Um, we also do, uh, we get funding from 40, last year we got 42 out of the 47 towns that we serve. Um, some are just so hard to get those 100 signatures um, it, it, that it makes it, you know, for what we would get. Um, so we get it from the towns, we, uh, we do foundation grants and individuals. So we're pretty well funded. Um, I will say that around the country, and in Vermont as a whole, adult education numbers have dropped off pretty dramatically. Um, especially in certain areas it might be higher because, uh, because of the immigrant populations. In Vermont, it's dropped off pretty dramatically since 2000, and well really since the recession. Um, we have we had a goal in 2016 to increase our number of students. Um, as a whole, and also to increase our students over 25 years old, because those are, over 25 is a really interesting demographic. Those are the people that really need our services a lot. And the younger ones, we love them, but high school age kids are often best served in the high school. Um, so we're really proud of the fact that we, we've seen an increase. So last year we did see a little bit of a dip in certain areas, uh, especially the more rural areas, Orange County especially. Um, but the rest of the state, you know, you're looking 25, 30% decreases in students. Do you think that's a positive sign? No, it's not. I, I would say that if we, there was no need for us, it would be a better world. Uh, but no, it's not a positive. I think there's a couple of things going on with the, the low unemployment. People are working. They don't have time or they're working multiple jobs. The need is out there, and that's why we know. We realize that even though we saw a dip last year, we're going gung ho this year to say we want to we want to exceed those numbers because the need is still there. Would would it behoove you to put something on front porch forum? 
Yes, it will. Um, and that's something we've done in the past. It's been about a year since we've done anything with the course forum. Um, generally, it's I have a I have a spreadsheet of you know people in all 47 of the towns that we serve of people who will do that. So it, it's yes, that is that's a big part of the outreach, and it it, it yields usually something. Maybe if we post that we're doing GED testing, we'll get people calling for that. So. One of the things that came to my mind is um, that there's a big need for is uh, people knowing how to write a resume. You know, because people come to my employer and say, you know, can I fill an application? And I'm like, well, you know, we we like to get a resume from people, and I'm like, well, I don't know how to write a resume, you know. And I mean, I may not be either. I started in high school, a place I've been there 37 years, and you know, I read resumes all the time, but a lot of people don't know how to write them. In a cover letter. Yeah, um, and that's that college and career readiness that we're talking about is, you know, there's a lot of, we work also really with Department of Labor and um, Voc Rehab also, and they also do the, the cover letter and the resumes, but there's often underlying issues. Why can't they write a resume? Because right. they can't write. Why can't they write a good cover letter? Because they can't read the job posting well enough to, to process and understand, okay, how do I do this? So that that's goal based. If someone comes in and says, I, you know, I really want to be able to write a, a resume, we're going to work with them on that. Now we might have to go back and work on some of those basic skills. We'll try to do it in a way that is really going to work for them. Everyone's different. Um, most most of the time, it's one on one, which is awesome. And we have over a hundred volunteers in our organization from all walks of life that. You know, you talk about connection to the community, that's immense also. Um, you know, and those connections that people make with their volunteers often yield those jobs. Like, you know, their volunteer says, oh, you know, I know someone who's looking for, you know, looking for help. So it, it's goal-based, and that's one of those things that we are really working on. That's great. Well, we appreciate you coming in to explain it. You know, it sounds like a great, great resource. Yeah, we, you know, like I said, the world would be a better place if there was no need for us. But there is. Mm -hmm. And we are, we're going to be here and, you know, up and away. And I'd love to see this learning center, I think, was 100, I said 128, 128 students last year came through this learning center. That's a lot for a little second floor. Yeah. Um, the, just the Morrisville residents alone were over 1,000 hours. So... Keep it up. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now, do we have somebody here from the Colina Howard Nichols Center now? Yes. I thought so. Welcome. Is it helpful, Mike? Sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Becky Ganya, the executive director at the Colina Howard Nichols Center. Do you want me to start by just yeah. giving you a little information, and yeah. then please ask your great questions. <laughs> so as I think a lot of you are probably pretty familiar with Clarina, we've been around for actually almost 40 years. Um, we are most well known for our shelter, which I'll talk a little bit about, but we do so much more that I'm not sure everyone really does understand. Um, in our previous fiscal year, we served 454 people. This last fiscal year that just closed on June 30th, we served 403 people. Um, those are usually pretty staggering numbers uh, for people to hear, again, in this small community um, of folks needing our services. Um, those services range anywhere from a hotline call, um, just someone kind of wanting to know what their options are, thinking about leaving an abusive relationship, um, or a sister, or a mother, or a neighbor wanting to know how they might support someone who's in an abusive situation. Um, and then go all the way to sort of our most intense services that might be working with someone all the way through a criminal court process or through divorce and custody proceedings um, or sheltering someone. Um, last year we sheltered 37 individuals um, in our shelter. Um, we have a six bedroom shelter in the community that's a discrete location. Um, this first quarter of this fiscal year that we just started July 1, we actually sheltered 28 individuals in the first quarter. So. We're clearly on track to um, bust those numbers um, this year. Um, it does ebb and flow, it kind of depends. Um, I was actually in this room a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, talking about the housing crisis. Um, and one of the reasons that our shelter numbers actually last year were down was because people are in shelter with us for so long, um, because they can't find housing. 
um, and that really affects who else we can serve, actually, and we're turning a lot of people away, or having to put them in motels, um, which is not a great situation either. Um, so, so that's really tough. So um, we work really closely with a lot of our community partners and others and sit at a lot of tables to try to help address those social service issues, housing issues, mental health issues, substance use issues, everything that we can to help make sure the folks we work with can be really successful. Um, we served about 100 folks last year through the criminal court process. Um, we have an advocate specifically that's housed at the state's attorney's office in Hyde Park, and she's the advocate that works directly with those folks who are the victims of crimes so around domestic or sexual violence. Um, and that's everywhere from just getting in information from a victim, what they want to see from the proceedings, um, to informing them throughout the proceedings, helping them understand um, what their rights are, what their options are, um, safety planning, you know, any, anything imaginable um, to support folks through that. We do offer some financial resources. We try to help people get on their feet as much as possible. Sometimes it's food cards and gas cards. Sometimes it's help with rent or utilities, um, setting some up, someone up with new beds or you know, household supplies when they're moving out of shelter, um, any, basically anything we can do. That's a little great. bit in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So another great resource. Do we have any, any comments? But both the entities that are sitting here tonight request funds from the other yes. Valley towns, yep. county, around, around the county. I appreciate it because I understand that the services don't stop with right. people inside the borders of our community. That's right. And although your, your programs are, are centered here, based here, they provide support for all the towns in there, and, and many other towns Absolutely. for that matter. But uh, I appreciate the fact that you're not looking just at the taxpayers in Morrisville for your yeah. support. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I love both programs. Thank you. Okay. We're really fortunate because we're a shelter and not all of the areas around us, like Harvard, for example, has a shelter. We actually even get some town support from like Greensboro, for example, um, which has been really nice yeah. also. Awesome. That's great. How, uh, what other, where do you, else do you get your funding? So a, a large portion of our funding is state and federal funding. Um, we don't, at the moment, we don't have any direct federal funding, so um, we do have some grants that are federal that funnel through the state and come to us, and that's about 60% of our budget. We're, what I consider really small, our budget this year is $450,000, so less than a half a million dollars to do all the work I described and much more that I didn't tell you about. Um, so about 250 or so of that is state and federal funding. Um, obviously that our town support, a lot of grant writing, um, our annual appeal that we do, um, private philanthropy, um, fundraisers. Our board has really stepped up. We have a really active board of eight members right now. Um, and we have a fundraising goal and, you know, and budget line item in our budget every year. And we've actually increased that for the third year in a row. Um, and the board is doing it mostly through events. Um, but then we have some signature events we do now to try to just raise unrestricted funds. I want to thank you also for the way that you presented your numbers tonight. Mm -hmm. As a board, we sit here and hear um, entities in front of us and talk about how many um, people they served or how many days that they served them. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a staggering number, and it's kind of hard to put that. Right. And you talked about last year's numbers sound low. Right. However, they were long-term residents. Exactly. Thank you for clarifying that sure. so that the, everybody understands that yeah. numbers may sound like they're down, but okay. you provided a long-term service to the people who want so. Exactly. Yeah, and it's really tough. When someone comes into shelter, I mean, we look at, it takes about an average of six months um, if someone comes into our shelter and is really on a course of then moving into permanent, stable, safe housing. Now, not everyone is on that course. Some folks come with us for a night and make some other decisions. Some come to us for a little while and actually can return to their home in a safe way. Um, but for those who really are coming and starting out fresh, it is six months to go on every housing list, do every application, maybe get a voucher, maybe get a subsidy, save up money, whatever it might take. That's a long time. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thank nice. you. Thanks for all you do. We appreciate your support. Quick explanation. Yeah. All right. Any more community? Yes, questions? I got a couple. I was waiting for you, about three. No, I wanted to. <laughs> two questions. One is not a concern of mine. I want to know what they cost. You got two pieces of equipment you're buying. You don't put it in the paper. What the cost is, and who got the? I know who got the bid, but what, is it, what are we buying? Two trucks. Two trucks. I want to know what the costs are from my records. And if there's a budget numbers, um, I think. 143,100 for one. Is that for the, that tandem, whether it's No, the tandem is 180,600 that we're financing. Yeah. 
The yeah. other one's 143,100. That's a regular single axle. So that would have plowed doing it? Yep, that's the whole thing. Plow, body, everything. Okay. Okay. Bring it my second concern, you know what I'm going to read the gout rule. When are we going to address this? So I'm, 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 in the, I'm in the midst of talking to the state. Number one, it's illegal down there, I think, the guardrails. If I went down there with my truck, my tandem would go over the top of that like nothing. Or a milk truck, or a parachute truck. When are you going to fix the bridge? I know 10 years ago, 10, I got the report in my office to do a box cover the way you should do it was $250,000. If you don't believe me, I'll bring it in and show you. And now it's going to probably cost you seven hundred fifty thousand. I don't. I remember the two fifty, but actually we meet with FEMA and. FEMA. When are we going to do something about this? You've okay. been telling me that for ten, twelve years, Dan. I was just on the phone with Eric the other day, saying Buckwheat's going to be at the meeting there. <laughs> the We're going to talk about the Gels Road Bridge. <laughs> well, I want the road. I want me to have the road closed. Right. I can think I can push it. Hard. You're right. I think I'm going to start putting free hard. It should come to the top of the list. When? For sure. I want to know when. Well, when you guys want to well, do FEMA, it. FEMA right. is coming to town to do an inspection on our, our damage sites, correct? Correct. They are going to look at that bridge. Now, I can tell you that when they look at the bridge, they're going to look at two different things. They're going to look at first of all. They're going to look at the collar, not the bridge. Yeah, sorry. I'll call it what it is. We'll call it, they're oh, going to look at the collar. The You're right. Mm -hmm. They're going to look at the collar. They're going to look to see if the structure was damaged. And then if it wasn't damaged, you're going to see how much material, manpower we put into it, and which one they're going to cover. I was talking to Dan today, and my, my point had been that this is, if we look at this as a singular event, and they say the structure is not damaged, and they just want to cover material in time, then it's, it's a small number, isn't it? However, if we look back in our history, and a not very deep history, 20 years, how many times have we had to go and do that bridge? That culvert, excuse me. And... Yeah. So the conversation with FEMA will be just about that because I'm not sure, Buckwheat, that they're going to come in and say, we'll cover 75% of your construction costs, put a bridge in here, or a box, whatever, and do it right. They may come in and say, well, the structure's not damaged. We'll help you with the materials and time. The structure's damaged. They'll say it's all rotten. So um, I'm hopeful that we can talk to them and during our conversations discuss history and, and bring that up and impose upon them that this this needs a fix. You've got to let them know now. That, that was at my time, when I was, grew up here in Morristown, that was a stagnant steam bridge. It was taken out by the select board. Nobody on this one. And I remember the conversation down there, and I'll never forget it. And uh, they threw the culvert in, and the farmer said it was never going to work. We didn't have a floodplain. We never had a floodplain here until they put that culvert in. That was all cornfield all through that area. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be at that meeting with that dumb what happened over the course of the years. So that was prime cornfields all through that area. And hay fields. Now it's a hundred year floodplain because of the stupidity we had on the select board. We can let you know when that meeting is and be glad to have you there. I'd like to be there. I, I, I just want to give them a light on what was going on here. Mm -hmm. yeah, because I, when I, I can tell you another story. I know you're going to vote on it tonight, and that's how much they know nothing, the Mull County Planning Commission. We were discussing bridges around Morristown, and I was at the meeting. They didn't even know that was a standing scene bridge at one time. That's stupidity. And they wanted me, you guys want to, want to, you want to vote them back, and I don't know what you're going to do, but... Um, they, I, had to, I had to explain to them where all the bridges were in Mull County, because I know where they all are. And they didn't have no idea. So, that was a standing bridge, and the state lady never knew it at the meeting at the Lamont County Planning Commission, the Lamont Planning Commission meeting. They didn't even know it. So that, that's, that's kind of people we got working for the state stuff. They don't know nothing. Ask the person that grew up here. I was going to say, you've been around long enough, so you're a good Well, they gotta, they're going to do some of that bridge. Yeah, I that, excuse me, call <laughs> <laughs> I, I may have started that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm kind of, I, I think it's illegal anyway now for the guardrails. If I drove my truck over that road now, intentionally, I'm going to go over that bridge, I could go over the top. Yeah. It'll all be done as piled sand and pebbles. Yeah. There's no gravel in that road. I got pictures of it. It's all sand and pebbles. There's no gravel they put in that road over here, Dan. You know it. It's all pure sand. 
Well, actually, we saw some gravel out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> gravel in the meadows now. I think. Yeah. Pure, pure sand. Yeah. yeah. We don't have any gravel in that gravel bed. Would that the other? Could I have one more concern? Go ahead. How are we coming on our gravel bed? Two fifty. We're working on the, the presentation for the application. I heard there's some, some some squirming going around down from the owner down there. No. I, I can I will speak to that. Uh, Don Avery's one concern was was uh, pretty straightforward and and uh, not I don't think too complex. He just wants to ensure that even though he has the 500 foot wellhead protection area around his spring, that where we are doing phases five and six of the gravel pit and the plan um, are not going to disrupt the flow of water to that spring. And he's I did protect it though when he said that that somebody came out in the public they all around your mouth. I said. I'll find out. Don't go right in your mouth. You know something. Mm -hmm. so, but you never do it anyway. Yeah. So he, that was his concern, and he he said he's consulted with the hydrologist. Wanted to make sure that we had at some point addressed that one concern. I, you know, it's it's not uh, for a public information meeting. The very first one on that permit, I thought it went pretty well. That uh, was if that's the most severe thing he's worried about. Then I think we can help to address that. And put it, put his fears. My, my main concern is that guilt trip. I think we can get enough neighbors over there to probably put something together and do something about it. Because yeah. they're getting a little fed up with it. I'm getting fed up with cleaning my field every time we have a flood down there. Yeah. You're not know, looking at the mess I got again. Mm -hmm. I don't mind stealing your gravel. But, <laughs> but not our gravel anymore. Hey, it's not like gravel. It's a problem. It's a stain. Yeah. My wife sitting next to you lived there for many, many years. And 14 years you know, I had my house up there. And that road was so. It's about time to get, if you spend $400,000 on two trucks on them all, I mean, you can put a, put a, you can put a bridge up. There needs to be something. We'll, we'll find out what it would be. It would be great to have you at that meeting. Well, it's going to be happy. They're going to be closed. They're going to be a big inconvenience. Don't chase them out of the buckwheat. You've you got, you got plates on that bridge now, too, holding that bridge up. You know you got plates in that, steel plates. You've had holes in that bridge before. I, I, I called you last year on that. I don't know if any steel plates that put no, I do. I remember hearing that. There's steel, because I called you two years ago on a Friday night. I called the town out because there was a hole right down through the, the, the culvert, okay. five foot hole. And I brought my excavator over to fill it in for you guys. So, so there's plates in that thing. And the bottom of it's all gone, completely gone. I've walked in it several times. So, okay. Just for one now. Yeah, we, well, we I, think, talk. I think it's time to move, move forward on it. Yeah, I agree. You spent two million, million dollars down Katie Ball and posted it on us. The state did that. We could have had that money down there. You say that had nothing to do with us. That was the state project. The state. Go ahead, sir. As uh, as Puckley stole my thunder about Bell Road, <laughs> um, I'm a resident in the area there, and, and I'm on that road every single day. And I think on top of what Buckley's saying, he's, he's absolutely correct. Uh, I've been there for 18 years now that I've lived in that, in that area. And the road in that particular spot has been horrendous. It has been holes constantly on that culvert. Um, but on top of that, what I really want to add to it now is it's been blockaded for the last three, four days, but for the last three days, as my wife has gone walking with the dog, the barricade has been blown over or whatever, and she has put it back because she has seen people driving through there, mm -hmm. narrowly missing the, the huge hole in the road there. Dan and I were there today. Mm -hmm. uh, we went around and inspected our sheets of your sites, and uh, the barriers had not been blown over, they were moved, and traffic was had been flowing on that one side of that bridge. It's That's really unstable. And you know, frankly, it could remain stable. It could that that one lane could remain stable. That's not the business we're in. We have to be in the business of caution. So we block that bridge off because it's in the public's best interest to not go through there and take a chance on something happening. People took it upon themselves to move the barriers. So for the liability of the town, we closed it off. We have been going back. We've asked the PD or asked the PD to go and check it uh, after commuter hours to make sure it hasn't been moved out of the way again. We found one of the cones flung off into the meadow. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, well, my so wife's picked it up and she's put it back on well, the road. Or give her my thanks. We were down there did the same thing today. But I, I look at it as it's a liability to the town. It's okay, only a so liability. If it's not secured properly yeah. where somebody can move it, then the town's going to be liable. God forbid somebody ever got hurt. And, and, and if we need to, we can dump loads of gravel in front of the bridge on each side so we to completely close it off. If the barriers aren't going to be working, but I can say right now all our resources, including our signage, are, are deployed. And our guys have been working around the clock in some cases. Oh, I don't, I don't I, I know that. I'm just, and it's just. And I appreciate what they do. That is one of our target areas. And like I said, FEMA's going to take a look at it and we're going to take them to look at it. Um, so then the but if you think it's safer for us, uh, it'd be better than just the signs, and we can dump some loads right in front of the, on either side of the bridge. So then my question is, if FEMA, if FEMA comes back and says, that, well, this isn't due to that one event. Then we, have, as a board, we'll have to look at the priorities of it. We have a bridge fund here. Um, I think $30,000 a year goes into that fund. It doesn't grow quickly, but it, it grows a little bit. And uh, I think we're in the range of 120000 in it right now. If I remember my numbers correctly. Something like that. Um, we've got about 90, probably $150,000. Okay. Well, thank God I was under. Not over. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we will look at it. Uh, we've had this conversation. Buckwheat's not the only squeaky wheel, but he's, a, he's an effective one. And uh, okay. it, it is a problem. It is a problem. And it, and it, and it creates a backlog. It, it is so narrow that it causes the flooding earlier. And I can tell you that folks from the state will tell you that those open meadows there help to relieve the flooding because it offers a place for the water to disperse slowly and come back in slowly, but it doesn't help the residents who are trying to get to and from home. And, and well, it work. does because my whole field gets flooded out yeah. when that happens. So. Yeah. So it, it, we, we are not ignoring the voices we're hearing about that bridge, that culvert wanting to be a bridge. So. Well, the culvert should never been put in in the first place. Agreed. It worked fine. My standing thing we're in right built down there. Yeah. I was down there like morning earlier. It, it was over on the banks a little bit up in the fields, yeah. But it was going through fine. It was still three feet below my girders. Yeah. And, and I got I got seven beams underneath that bridge. So if it goes, it's gonna be a hell of a mess, but it, it ain't gonna fall in though. Yep, it was a, at the time they made the decision, it was strictly a financial decision on their part. To save money, they went to that. No, it, was, it wasn't financial. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to express what I heard, but it wasn't financially. It's all stupidity. So. <clears throat> and I never forget the words. So leave it at that. All right, we'll move on now. Kevin is here. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, if you would take assess that and see if that bridge would be safer for us to put some, a couple loads in front of it mm -hmm. uh, to block it on both ends. If, if We're going to have this, this stake here in FEMA doing the initial thing tomorrow. It's not whether they're okay. going to repair it, they're just doing the initial storm damage assessment. Yeah. I would really like them to, to take a look at that and not put that off on Kevin since we'll have that resource okay. until tomorrow. Yeah, I'm not looking to put, I'm right. not looking to fill a hole. Right. I'm looking to block the bridge, to block the culvert. Boy. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all, that's all I'm saying, because the folks that live there, if they're seeing this time and time again, then uh, well, I moving think back away well, once. Well, we saw today, it wasn't even, yeah. somebody didn't even bother to get out of the vehicle. Yeah, they ran over the They just ran over them. And dragged it. Somebody ran over that column, but I came through there today. Yeah. I did use the road, and I will use the road, because I have to go through there. I go back and forth to Elmer all the time, all day long. And they run around the other way, but then the other road was closed off. <coughs> that all boxed in. So I said, screw I'm going down through there. There's plenty of room in there. On the left, we're on the right side coming in. Mm -hmm. so the left side, no. Okay. You gotta get up there somehow. All right, is there any more community concerns? Concerning your liquor control tonight, there. And we believe you got some PC here tonight. We'll go into new business. Delinquent tax collection. Taxes has, their delinquent taxes has 
come due, and so now is when we would um, hire him to actually start tax sale proceedings. So we had had a conversation kind of to come back to you and show you the list to see. Um, so the first box is the ones that he had sent letters to and still have not paid, um, and then that's the balance due. Some of them have made partial payments but have not paid in full. And then the ones underneath are um, the ones that, for the mobile homes that we did not um, have him write the demand letter for. So I just need guidance of which properties, if you want me to send them all, if you don't, if you want to have a dollar amount, if you, how you want to go. So the, the amount of money on the outside of the box is we can collect up, so he's saying that it's between $800 and $900 to do a full tax sale from the beginning to the end. We can collect up to 15% of the principal, of the balance due in legal fees. So what that is is a calculation, if it went to the full amount of the tax sale, up to how much we could recoup of our legal fees. Have any of these people contacted you? Um, After the letters have come out? Not since the letters have come out, except for the ones that, um, the last two, <coughs> the last three, I think, I got partial payments for. Um, but, but not the, not the um, ones about that. And typically once, because I send a letter that says, once I've turned them over to the attorney, then negotiations, conversations with me end, everything goes through the mm -hmm. attorney. So they're not used to, this is a new procedure how he's doing things, and they're not used to being able to reach out and contact me at all. What do you guys want to do? Is it cost us? It costs us a certain amount of money to do it. You know, what's worth it to do? These lower ones, it wouldn't seem like it would be, but the upper ones. Anything about the thousand bucks? That's what I'm thinking. Is is this something that? Drop the bottom four. An ongoing? Are, are, are these people ongoing? Like is um, this continuous here? Typ typically, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's drop that six twenty four seventy six and go up. So anything that they owe a thousand dollars or more, start tax sales proceeding. Yeah. I, I, I'm concerned about the people who, are if this is continuous year after year, that they're not paying their taxes, and is there they're not coming in and talking to you about it? You know. That, our like, our why policies they can't? before had always been that we turned over everything, even if it was five dollars, well, ten dollars or more, because um, the BCA has allowed me to pay ten dollars or less, but. Um, so anything $10 or more, we turned over for tax sale. And the local attorneys have basically um, done the service for free. Now they've all been retiring. And so we actually had a county clerk meeting that we hosted two weeks ago. And it, we joined with Washington and Lamont County. And um, it sounds like there's not many attorneys out there anymore that are doing the tax sales for free because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of liability um, for So it's that. not worth it for small amounts? It's not worth it. Right. So that $1,000 would make sense mm -hmm. too? I think one of the things, just correct me, like a sales state, if you take something underneath 1000 another tax year that could be up above 1000 so I mean, it's so we get caught. Mm -hmm. So maybe this year they're not going to go to tax sale, but next year they're well. Okay. And different towns do it differently. Some towns looked at it quarterly, and then every quarter they're having a tax sale. Um, some people set a threshold of a dollar amount, like a, around a thousand, and then once it was there, they um, they started the tax sale. We've just typically done everybody right. once a year. Do we know anything about their personal circumstances? Um, only the second one on the list is called me. Um, and it's, it has a personal matter that they're 
Second one on the top of the list. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Struggling with. Oh. Nobody else is calling me. So if we do drop these bottom ones, mm -hmm. that stays there. Mm -hmm. So next year it would be up enough so you'd be worth going after? Right. Yeah. If there's that potential or they could come in and pay it. But there's a potential there. Because I myself, I mean, I don't like this idea of somebody getting away with it, even if it costs us money. We all pay our taxes, so I don't know why we can't make them. But maybe that would work to let it ride as long as they don't get lost. Right. So it wouldn't be wiping out the taxi scheme. They would still know it. They would still, interest would still be accrued on it. Um, I can continue to send letters if you want me to spend the 50 cents a month um, to constantly remind them. Um, and it continues to be a lien on their property if they go to sell or refinance or anything, they're going to ask me if taxes are due. Yeah. It sounds good. Yeah. <coughs> it's just never cost us anything. Right. Yeah. So, change things. Yeah. You need a motion because we're playing a standard here or a policy? Yes, please. Because Jim will want one before he moves forward. I know Jim. So I'll make a motion that uh, we move forward with tax sale on any property whose taxes are in arrears of $1,000 or more. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> Next, we'll discuss the industrial park sidewalk. Yes, please. Well, we have um, the sidewalk is about it's half built right now. And some business owners out there, along with Howard Minosh, have put in a sidewalk that goes from Munson Avenue, where House of Pizza is, right to the corner where Turfer is. And um, we have a lot of pedestrian traffic there now, a lot, like, you know, probably 20 or 30 every day at least. Uh, I see it because I work right there. But we also have people cutting through our business and people in a motorized uh, wheelchair narrowly getting hit by big trucks. And the hope is to put the rest of the sidewalk in, you know, with some of our sidewalk money, and uh, so we can have it be safe. And right now, there's a lot of trucks going in and out there, not just our business, but all the businesses around there. It's, it's getting really busy and a lot of people use it. People coming from Colonial Manor, people just exercising during the day, taking breaks, out for walks. And um, I think it'd be great to have that sidewalk go all the way around since the businesses chipped in and paid out of it. It'd be nice to have the rest of it done. Use some of our sidewalk money. Do we have money in our budget? No, not anymore. No, I mean we we spent pretty close to fifty thousand dollars this year on sidewalks. So this would be you know a next summer project. There's no way we could do it this construction season. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much over now. So we have to do other projects. And we could put put it in the, for the budget for yeah, next year. We put sidewalk. I think we put fifty thousand dollars on the next year's. Um, and just for comparison, we Doug and the crew did a lot of good sidewalk work up on Commerce this year. And we spent pretty close, just the material, $44,000. That gives you an idea um, of the type of money that we, we spent on sidewalks in one of those kids here. So I haven't done an estimate up on this short stretch. It's not a that long stretch. That was 42, I think, from a month in. Yeah, yeah. this one wouldn't be as long. <coughs> um, wouldn't be as long, yeah. Um, and we wouldn't need to put any curb there because I think it was just, you know, grass strip. Typically what we've been doing is the village crew or somebody been going into prepping it and then we've been contracting out the actual placement of the sidewalk itself and it's worked. I mean, for, we, we've gotten a lot more done doing that. Um, it, it seems to work really well from that perspective. So rough guess maybe between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 for that stretch of sidewalk. That's just a very, very rough guess. Where did we do a fifty thousand dollar banner? Common Street this year. That's yeah. fifty thousand dollar banner. Yes. Yeah. And that's not our labor. That's just materials. Yeah. Uh, Jim Bradley. Jim Bradley. I know who did it. Yeah. 
I think his contract was 37 all by itself, something like that. Yeah, it was, it was no, plus, plus, Yeah, so plus materials, you know, asphalt. You go all the way down there or spot it? Doug, you're here. I think we'd already had some done. We went from um, <clears throat> Union Street, um, if you look it down through on the right hand side all the way down to JM. Yeah. Yes, and then on the other side, oh, up, up there by, uh, we went uh, from the other side of Union Street down through to, oh, what's his name there, had the furniture place. Yeah, yeah. 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 right in there. Yeah. yeah. So we we, you know, we rented the mini excavator and stuff too. We did all the demo work. Yeah. I don't have time to ride around town on the weekend. I check things out. But. Yeah. You get the hot mix in. There's all the hot mix in. You get a match in. Right. Yeah. I've seen some work over there, but I didn't think I saw that much work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I'd like to like to see us do that. You guys want to do a motion? May I ask a question? Yeah. Is that just for industrial? Park, or is that going to also provide sidewalk on Harold Street? Thanks. I'd like to see that happen too. I well, think it's like I mean, one, I, one I end up down there quite a bit, and you're right about the pedestrians walking all over the place. But they use everything down there. I mean, there are people all, all day down there walking up um, Munson Avenue all the way up to Vianor. Mm -hmm. I know that there's sidewalk on some of that. Right. And the same thing with Harrell Street, like you said, Colonial Manor and all through there. And, you know, the, during the wintertime, during the springtime, they have nowhere to walk but the road. You know, it's not like they can really walk on, on the grass areas or anything like that. Um, but I was just curious if what the long-term plan was for pedestrians down there. Because I've noticed a huge increase over the last couple of years, especially you know, noon time, one o'clock, you know, when people are on their lunch breaks and stuff like that, it's busy down there. There's a lot of people driving in one. The majority of the money we spent on sidewalks in the last few years has been about re rebuilding mm -hmm. what we have here in the core of the village because they were in such disrepair yeah. and the heaviest volume of traffic. The, the sidewalks out there would be brand new construction. Right. And we budget $50,000 a year. It doesn't give us a, a tremendous distance of sidewalk. Right. Um, I just wasn't sure what the long term. I'm just thinking in phases, was. you know, you do yeah. the next section. Harrow Street's quite a bit wider than Industrial Park Drive, so it's yeah. a little safer anyway. But I, my idea is to eventually have it come back to Munson Avenue so it's a loop, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing you'd have to worry about if you were to come up on the side of Harrow Street is the water runoff. <coughs> I know. Yeah. That's a big deal right there. I wondered about the other side, Doug, because I was looking at that. There's there's you know, a possibility onto the other side, you'd have crosswalk to skip right. over right. and come up through. It looks like you'd have less to deal with if you did it on that side. Yeah, you'd have you'd have some lawn that would have to be taken out of there, which you know you'd have to deal with that. But other, you know, if you water can. deal is that would be chaotic. Right. Right. So, so we, my, but I'm not opposed to the sidewalk. Um, but we have no money this year. We don't have a budget yet. I think, from my perspective, I think there's a lot of sidewalks in town that need to be addressed and something to discuss during the budget process and then identify priorities would be my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is a big priority in my, my view. You know, even some of the other sidewalks, at least it's a sidewalk. You can walk on it. Right? You can walk on it. This is a safety issue. Well, sir, are you looking to add, are you talking to the budget box that you're looking to add to the 50000 we already budget, or are you looking to guarantee we put the <coughs> next budget's 50000 toward that sidewalk? I'm just looking to bring up a safety issue. No, no, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. I don't disagree with that piece of it. Yeah. But I'm not sure. Maybe we, it's on yeah, top of the motion. Yeah, I don't know. We don't have any money. To but we will have. We're going to do the budgets right now. But it could be that the sidewalk that you're talking about on uh, Munson is next year, 2020, and then 2021 is looking at a budgeting in for Harold Street. Right. I don't know how. I don't know. Well, I don't know how much. Next year, then Harold yeah, Street. I don't know how right. much it would cost to do Harold Street. Uh, I think that will probably be a little more. I think we have to put a curb in there on that. You, to be 
good, yes. You'd have to put that in because you have to wear the way that one sets, you're really not yeah. going to be able to have a grass strip in there like you could on an industrial park right. out. Yeah. But I think once you get to Harold Street, you're going to have to put a curb in so you have that separation there. To I have an idea that there's probably enough safety concern areas in town that we might want to take a look at this uh, as far as the possibility of a, a larger vote, a larger dollar number of separate line item. And I, I say that because we, we did a $500,000 vote for pavement because we were running so far behind. If the sidewalks, because I've been a proponent of fixing the sidewalks on Elmore Street from Trip Corner up through, which are level with the road and horribly dangerous. Mm -hmm. yep. So there How many feet is that sidewalk that are Which one? The one they're talking about over there at the, the, uh, the industrial park? I don't know what the distance is. It's from the corner of Turtle Ford down to Buckwood. I couldn't tell you the distance is. We better take a wheel and measure it seriously. Well, yeah, Mike, off. Probably, you know, right around quarter miles. 100 yards, maybe. I don't think it's quarter miles. 100 yards, it's all from, from the corner down to the down to uh, Harold Creek. That's it, four or five hundred feet. Four or five hundred feet? So, that's, yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to. I'm probably a little short on that, but it's not a quarter mile. I don't think it's that long. Isn't part of the sidewalk finished though on Harold Street? I mean, Munson. I can wheel it. It's a longer section he did from Munson Avenue to where it ends now, and it's forty-two thousand. Forty-three thousand. What? Forty-two thousand dollars. Fifty-two dollars a foot. I would agree with you Eric, that I think uh, this comes up every year as a pretty hot topic item, mm -hmm. uh, and I think taking some sort of inventory and maybe some global, more global view of our sidewalks. Long-term plan. Yeah. I agree. With a plan. And would, then take it to the be better suited, and I think, quite honestly, we probably deserve, uh, the, the taxpayers deserve that at the town meeting day this year anyway, because it does come up. Well, it does come up and people want to want to do sidewalks. Is that a yeah. foot walkway or have you got a four foot? You can do five. Five. Yeah. Also, during that discussion, we can talk about if we keep getting too much sidewalk. We got a sidewalk plow right now that's in the repair shop, and well, you're we're going to have to have tools. You're going to hear about that from me during the budget. I think it's, wait a minute, wait a minute, that snowblower's supposed to be lasting us 20 years now. I know, that's what I say, too. What did they tell you they, about that's that? That's what job? we were told. What did they tell you about that job? You got tough. <laughs> Yeah. You really got to. I know. The trackless one? Yes. But it is the holder, the 270 holder. holder. It's still in New Hampshire, still in Concord. Yeah. Then all they're all summer. Mm -hmm. yeah, cut your losses and buy something different. But it, what Brian's saying is true. And with the taxpayers, we'll inform them during the town meeting. We, we try and put out as much information as we can. We are uh, we're growing. We're growing quickly, and the, the sidewalks is a definite safety issue in town. And if people want their tax dollars spent building sidewalks, we'll do it. Those sidewalks need to be maintained. That means clearing them in the wintertime in, in particular. That's more man hours. That's more. That's a second piece of equipment out doing sidewalks, not just one. We're talking miles and miles of sidewalk in the town. And so if, if there's an increased maintenance expense when we talk about building new sidewalk. There's going to be more expensive than just the cost of building. So we just want taxpayers aware of that. I would think we'll buy something and we'll have somebody go look at it, no equipment, first of all. And first of all, you bought a piece of equipment that was, that was not hydraulic. If that was a hydraulic machine, you wouldn't be having the problems you got with it. <coughs> yeah, but you weren't, nobody wanted to listen to anybody, so that's what you got, you got a death warrant. All right, let's move on to number three. Who proposed compensation plan? This is our, our standard pay shop for, for non bargaining or non collective bargaining unit employees. Um, the, the increases this year mirror the Social Security um, pay raise increases at 1.6%. So that's what the, the chart increased by. And that's the cost of living increase. Just across the board. Across the board. Make a motion to approve the proposed compensation plan for fiscal year 2020 2021. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? So passed. 
Number four, increase EMS positions from four part-time to five part-time. Hi, good evening. Happy birthday, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Um, that won't get you anywhere, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I think my best shot right at the end. Um, so we've seen a, a pattern for since about the time I came on board of having anywhere from 24 to 36 hours a week uh, of open schedule time at EMS uh, with the anticipation and the hope that volunteer staff would be able to fill those. Uh, those shifts have been getting filled uh, and every week it's becoming a decision of uh, that, that I'm making of filling that uh, at straight time but putting one of the part-time over, uh, one of our part-time members over the contract of 23 hours in order to fill that shift at straight time or myself or uh, Corey, the assistant chief, filling it at overtime. Uh, as an extrapolation of that, uh, frankly, our overtime budget in the EMS is upside down right now uh, because of needing to cover these shifts. Um, the, uh, the handout that you have there, the colored one, is a breakdown of our current staff, including uh, volunteer and, uh, uh, and paid members. Uh, the members highlighted in yellow are uh, me volunteer members who have not been feeding, uh, meeting even a 15 hour a month requirement in, uh, in doing time with us. Uh, the members in red are on approved leave. Uh, the members in blue are new members to us who uh, are still doing orientation and training and are not ready to act as a second crew member on an ambulance. Um, the, and frankly, the situation is exacerbated a little bit for us uh, with the passing of Sharon Duffy who was our anchor on Friday nights uh, with Sharon gone and her partner uh, her partner on her shift was also her partner uh, and, uh, and Tracy has no timetable for coming back to us because she's had to pick up extra hours at work to compensate for Sharon's loss of income uh, in their family. Uh, as some of you are aware, uh, I mean, uh, this past week I was at the Vermont EMS conference. It was in a leadership seminar, uh, and we spent the entire afternoon with my peers doing, talking about recruitment and retention. And it's an issue just not for us. It's an issue statewide, district-wide, nationwide uh, in EMS, and, 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 and Denny probably sees it on his side, too, with, uh, with volunteer firefighters, uh, that uh, uh, to, to tag on to what our... Uh, our adult learning colleagues said earlier, you know, people are working multiple jobs. It's giving us less options for volunteers to fill these shifts. So routinely, 24 to 36 hours a week, we're having to fill uh, either with a, a paid person at straight time going over their contracted hours or with me or Corey at overtime. Uh, and while the, uh, the overtime is personally enriching to me, and I don't mind, uh, it's part of my obligation to help fill the shifts. Uh, as a manager, I look at it and it scares me. Uh, uh, when I look uh, look at how much overtime we're putting out just to cover shifts, and uh, Dan and I have had some some good discussions about it along with Tina, um, and and that's the deal. And we're, what we're hoping is that if we add a fifth tw a fifth 23 hour a week position to the mix, uh, that will hopefully prevent us from having to come back to you and ask for another uh, and ask for a full time position in the next budget year. I just want to explain a few things from my perspective. Bill and I have both had these conversations. You know, part-time employees, for a number of different reasons, we restrict working less than 23 hours a week. Um, if we start going over 23 hours a week, we're obligated um, to start paying out a lot more in benefits, and that includes um, you know retirement benefits. That you know, that's state law that we have to start doing that. There's you know, vacation time, sick time, all those things that, that tick up once we get over that 23-hour um, um, time frame a week. And one of my fears, I'm not afraid to say it, is that you know, we, we do this and it starts to get a routine. When we get audited by the municipal retirement system, they don't really give us a choice. We have to go back and make all that up both the employee share and our share at that point in time. So I've been on bill that, hey, you, you can't keep doing this. You can do it every now and then, that's fine, but you can't routinely have these people going over the, the 23 hours a week. I think the other perspective, we've done a lot of analysis, you know, and he's right, it's, it's not just, it's a nationwide problem with volunteers, but, you know, I think it's important that everybody understands that the addition of this will put us 
well into a primarily paid staff now, not a volunteer staff. Correct. I agree with Dan. This fundamentally adding yes. this fifth person takes us to almost a 70% paid agency. It fundamentally changes the face of the agency exactly. from, from volunteer uh, to, to more of a, uh, at the best, a combination department, a true combination department and of I, paid and on-call staff. We, you know, I don't think it's right, wrong, or indifferent. I just want everybody to understand that that's where we're hitting that transition point now, where it's you know, primarily a paid staff that's covering our shifts. And I think you know, over all the discussions that we've had in the years over how to provide you know, EMS service to the community, we're, we're crossing a you know, pretty important line there when we're doing that, that you know, primary shift coverage now is all paid staff. And it's, it's, Bill's doing his best down there, and the reason why you know, I look at the overtime and I see his hours, well, you know, it's not only good for the budget, but it's not good for the employees either when I have him working, you know, he's working right. 60 hours I, weeks. I, 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 um, I'm, I'm routinely at my 40 hours by about Wednesday afternoon. Um, so, you know, none of that's good for anybody because burnout happens, and that's, you know, that's the other thing that we really don't want to get into. But I, I think, it's, once again, I don't think it's us, you know, just us. And there was a new story I know that was sent around to the select board a couple weeks ago. This is a problem all across the board, but I think it's important for everybody to realize that we're, you know, it, it, what was primarily volunteer service, you know, is no longer that. It's primarily a paid service. And the volunteer is still very important to what we, we do and how we do it. But I think it's, it's an important thing that we're doing now, or a notable thing. It's not important, but we're transitioning to a mostly paid staff to, to meet our requirements under our license. I would just ask Tina, do you have anything you want? No, just with this addition of this, uh, if you vote to uh, include this fifth part-time person, it'll make us a 67% paid service. Not much we can do about it, really. You're spending way more money in overtime to pay the other people than you would to hire a part-timer. Sure. Uh, we, um, at, at an advanced EMT level, uh, the, uh, the cost of the part-timer at 23, at 23 hours a week uh, would be about 21 to a year. Um, and right now we're, we're looking at about 35 k in overtime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Smart thing to do that. Do you have someone in already on board? Uh, I, I would prefer to do it in-house so we have a quicker learning curve, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I didn't want to get in front of it, uh, get out in front of it too much uh, and, uh, without uh, your collective taking a look at it and uh, giving us some approval and a uh, way to go. Makes sense to me. <clears throat> yeah, it's not like we can't do it, we've got to do it. Yeah, and we're already paying the money Everybody anyhow. Well, it's going to save us on overtime. Yeah. Did you put it in the motion? Yep. So, what's the... There's one right now. There's one right now. Right. Okay, good. Thank you. I move to increase the permanent part-time EMS positions working no more than 23 hours a week with no benefits from four positions to five positions for an added annualized budget amount of $23,600 effective immediately. Second. I have a motion and a second. I have further discussion. So you think this will fix it for now? I think, I think it will give us a way to go ahead to get ahead of it. Um, and then I'm happy to come back to you in 60, 90 days and give you an update about uh, whether we've improved our overtime numbers, which I anticipate we would, uh, or uh, whether we need to take a long, hard look about adding a full-time slot you know, with the next budget year. That's true. Honestly, uh, in my conversations with Dan and Tina, that's what I'm hoping to avoid, is that we can use this fifth full-time slot. Uh, I've got f uh, four people who are currently orienting as volunteers. If I can get them in the mix, add this fifth slot uh, for 23 hours a week um, that we can get ahead of this and not be paying the amount of overtime we are now and avoid having to add a full-time slot. It's something that me and Bill watch all the time. So, I mean, we've been paying a lot of attention to it. And, you know, we've had a lot of good discussions about how to, how to come up with solutions to the problem. 
All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill, thanks for all your, your data, too. Uh, I'd love that from Tina and Dan. Oh, thank you, Tina and Dan. Next, discuss changes to personnel policy section 9. This is really a policy that has come up in the last couple of weeks. Um, and probably one of those things that's in a policy that you know, doesn't always get a lot of attention. I'll be the first to say that even in my position here, I've worked at outside jobs before, but I've, I've told the board verbally that I'm doing it, but I've never done it in writing. And we have several people um, you know, here that work other jobs. Um, anybody in the department head level has always come to me and told me that they're doing it, which is the right thing to do. And you know, I don't think we've ever really found a conflict of interest. But we've never required it in writing. I think what I'm recommending to the board is, is that we remove that in writing requirement. Um, I think they should do it. Their priorities have always been the town, um, and then review it to see if there's any conflict of interest for what they're doing. I think the other important thing is, once again, this only applies to um, those employees that aren't covered by a collective bargaining union agreement. Do you hear a motion? Make a motion to amend the personnel policy section 19, outside employment replace. Section nine. Uh, uh, section nine, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sleep. Section nine to replace the second paragraph with the following prior to accepting any outside employment, employees will disclose their intent to their supervisor and obtain prior clearance that such employment does not constitute a conflict of interest. When we talk about outside discussion, so if we're talking about outside, we're talking about being self employed as well as yes. moonlighting. Yeah. Okay. Is that a second? It is a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So pass. Next, storm update from Kevin. You want to tell us the story? We've only allotted you three minutes, Kevin, so. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> Bad. It was bad. We got a lot of rain and a lot of washouts. Um, going around uh, V Trans, the stake I was here on Friday, we looked at the bridge on the gulf, or the culvert, sorry. Um, Left. And we also looked at the one up on Mud City Loop that is another identical. It's doing the exact same thing, if not worse. So those two have both been documented by VTrans already as of Friday. Um, just the crew has been doing an excellent job. We're trying to minimize impact to everyone. I don't believe anybody is an island at this point. Um, everybody has one way to get from point A to B at least. Um, we've had a lot of Encouragement, very few uh, disappointing calls. Mainly everybody is very understanding of what's taking place with this disaster. Um, we're still finding, even today, um, places of erosion that weren't there Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the streams undermined mm -hmm. down underneath, mm -hmm. and then over Sunday, today, they slid. Mm -hmm. so, Things are still popping up that we're looking for. Um, so we're not completely out of the woods yet. Uh, Mud City Loop is pretty much all the way open. Walton Road, Fontaine. I mean, I think the list goes on and on. Everything was on the center town, not so much on the center town. Um, wind wise, it was almost the, the same. All our trees were down over here, not so much over on this side. Um, uh, FEMA and the state will be here tomorrow morning. Uh, we have a meeting with them. We're going to go around, look at pictures, see what we have. Um, tried to prioritize as much as we could to make sure emergency vehicles, things like that, could get through first, and then went back and started repairing personal driveways at the end of the culverts where they come onto the roads. Um, it's been challenging. We've the crews have pulled together very well. We've Mr. Percy's going to love us. We've been hauling a lot of material out of his pit. So it's been a challenging couple, three days. Thank you for all the extra work. 
Yes. Well, and we're hoping that by the end of the week, if we get some answers on these culverts um, over there in the Mudsu, the road should be completely back open if we're allowed to do whatever we can do. Or they'll be closed. Oh, yes. but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most importantly, what Kevin and the highway crew have done is they've, they've treated this like a FEMA event from the very beginning. Right. So their documentation, Tina has a proven track record of doing this from the April storms and tropical storm Irene. So she's already trained them previous years on how to manage the paperwork. Um, so what you'll see is you'll have somebody holding a little dog tag and a number that documents the site, lots of pictures, lots of measurements before they even start the repair. So from the perspective of being able to go out and document yeah. the damage stuff, mm -hmm. um, they've so done an exceptional job of doing that, which is usually the, the biggest downfall of trying to get reimbursement from FEMA. So they've, they've really done a great job of doing that, tagging the numbers, you know, tagging the repair, documenting it, the hours, the material, the equipment, all that other great stuff. Once again, Tina set that up a long time ago when we had the April um, 2011 flood. Mm -hmm. She makes them use it now, even though I know they hate it sometimes. But when it gets into a set of circumstances like this, it's just a matter of routine for doing it. So they've done a great job doing all that documentation as well. Do I would, yeah, I would like to add too that the, these closed roads that we have out there, that's for public safety. If you see the cones, if you see the signs, you know, what? we put those out there. Road crew can't go out and police everybody, you know, to, to do it. You know, um, we put that there because we think it's not safe for you to use that road. And we still got crews out there working on the roads, on narrow roads. Please, for the, the public, please respect those, those signs for us. You get that, Andrew? <laughs> it may look safe, but it may not be. And, and sometimes we don't know if it's safe yeah. or not. Do you, do you have a guesstimate on what uh, the cost of, of the damage? I bet you we're close to the million dollars just right here in this town. Okay. Financial-wise, Tina put together a chart for you, you know, um, to tell you how much we won't be responsible for the full million, you know, by any scratch. Um, but she did put together a chart of some of the, the funds that are available to the select board um, to be able to use for our match on it. You know, fortunately, we do have enough reserve funds. Um, that we've built up over the years to be able to help cover our share of this. So it's just one of those things to keep in the back of your mind um, and how it all plays out. So. Um. Okay. Thanks a lot, Kevin and Doug. Yeah, thank you. And all the guys. And all the guys. Yeah. And Tina. And Tina and Dan. Dan. Tina, did you ride around a dump truck taking photos? I didn't. I was actually kind of disappointed this time. I didn't get to go out with my hard hat and my hip boots. Oh. That's okay. Thought, Kevin, Kevin, you know Kevin's got it under control. <laughs> I thought that was you holding the tag. No, it wasn't. She played switchboard operator. Yeah, I took all the phone calls. <laughs> So uh, I was going to do this under my hand, I'm going to more concerned, but I'll do it now because we're on top of the topic and, uh, and pass off these kudos. But Dan and I spent a lot of right around, and I can tell you that the prioritizing of the workload couldn't have been any better in my opinion. Uh, and what Kevin has explained to us as to how they assess things and how they got it was emergency vehicles, major roads opened, then they went on and they just worked down from there. From what I can see, the job sites, that's how they're attacking those as far as repair work and how they're doing that. We've got multiple job sites, repair sites going on all at the same time. Kevin's always the road man. Doug, I was spent time with this morning and our conversation was interrupted no less than seven times for phone calls. And that's all about materials. Uh, going about materials and finding materials, maybe who's got stone, who's got the right size stone. And we're not the only community coming after that stone. So the guys are on top of it. We've got trucks. They've hired uh, Savannah Entity trucks in order to help us with the hauling as well, uh, which is a necessity. Uh, uh, they, they've done a fantastic job. I will also say that we have members of our highway crews who have damage at their own homes that is, they're putting off because they are here dedicated to this community and their job and making sure that we're up and running. So. My hat is off to every one of them. And Kevin, welcome to the town of Morristown. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're drinking from the proverbial fire hose, and you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you all very much.
I'm wondering if, um, I know Eric has put out blurbs on Front Porch Forum about road work, maybe just something about Goltz Road, because you don't know Goltz Road is, is closed until you get down to 100, a couple feet from 100. Right. But We're maybe, out of science. <laughs> just, letting, just letting the public know maybe so, some of the roads we, that are to yeah, avoid. Or, yeah, I think maybe tomorrow, if you get a chance, we can rearrange some of the signage just to yeah. We can put a sign up there. They just ran completely out of signs, barrels, and cones, which were out. So. Well, one thing I want to say about the like, Geltro, the thing of it is, just like Eric said earlier, we could go out there and dump dirt, close the whole road, then they, they won't have it for use if, we, if they can't behave themselves and leave the signs and cones alone. Close it for a while and see what happens. That's what they didn't need. Yeah. All right. Next, approve warrants. Make a motion to approve the warrants. Second. Okay, motion and second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Go fast. TA report. A couple things. Um, just a quick reminder November 13th is the road hearing on the Long Hair Line at 4 p.m. I need at least a quorum for that. 13. What time you say? 4 p.m. Yeah, before it gets dark. 4 o'clock. Yes. With baby. That's a Tuesday. Wednesday. Wednesday. It's possible they not be there. We have a call. It's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. That's right, Eric, right? 13th at 4. Yeah, I already had it in there. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think it was a Monday. I thought we were here Tuesday. <laughs> I've, I've been up a long day to look at it already, um, but I, I won't be there. I'm working on town that day. Okay. So I have. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. three. Yeah, three. Good. Be there. All right. I'm okay. All right. So I got three. So I'm, I need that form then. So we'll, we'll be reminding you. So. <laughs> Okay. And you might want to text me because sometimes my email gets down again. All right. We'll it's working. Sure reach out to um, the signs for the Teen Center and just so you know, it's a kind of item at the last. So oh, okay. We did find some weighted ones that we could put out there. Good, thank you. And just so everybody knows, um, last Saturday they did complete our paving contract as well. They did their own traffic control. So we do have our summer paving done and completed now. Um, they did their own traffic control because I knew the highway crew. Is that on here. Randolph? Randolph. They did the final pick on that. I'm pretty sure they did. At least they said they did in Bridge Street. Bridge Street is from, I haven't even had a chance. Yeah, I, I know you guys haven't had a chance. I didn't have a chance to look at it anyway. But I, I worked with a paving company so that we can get that done and off the plate before we're starting to get into worse cold weather now. So our paving contract has been completed. They're, they're going to upcharge us a little bit for traffic control on those days. But it was, to me, it was worth it to get it done. So. Will they be, who puts the lines on the road? Uh, state does that. I don't know if we'll be able to get those done mm -hmm. this year because of the temperatures. Um, this late year it might be a little hard to do that. State does that painting for us. We can try, but eh, it might be a push. The center line's done. And that's really it. It's good to be back. <laughs> Any questions for Dan? Thanks, Dan. Select board concerns. Judy. Um, I have a bunch. Um, the, the, uh, the last meeting we had, um, the cemetery association was here, mm -hmm. and I just was wondering if there's any follow-up with that. Yes, Sarah and I have some for you to talk about in this uh, executive session with the, uh, um, some of the, the legal issues, um, an attorney that we're going to look into hire to do that, and then um, we're looking to put money into next year's budget to help with the mapping. And then okay. Sarah, I, I know she's not finished yet working on some. Yeah, I don't program. have anything to report yet, but I've been um, researching mapping and software companies. I have another conference call with another one tomorrow. Um, and I've been working with Jane and um, Dennis. And um, I've also de been developing, because there's kind of a bunch of different aspects of the project. So there's the map, the getting up-to-date maps and fixing the records management. Um, there, and then there's the whole selling of the deeds and the inventory. Uh, so I've developed a sheet that they're reviewing for somebody to go and purchase a lot from Mark 
and then he would bring the sheet with me that would have the information and I could collect. The money flow is um, a separate issue. So I've started. We start looking at everything we'll have. We also reached out for the mappy piece over we just a pleasant view and say, hey, if we're going to do cemeteries, let's make sure that there's no issues up there either with the, the mapping piece of it. So um, that way, if we're going to do them, let's do them all at once and bring them all up there all at one time. I was, uh, what just struck me also was that the association goes out and cleans the, the tombstones, the headstones, and is that really their responsibility? That's, it seems like a lot to ask the volunteers to do. I think they contract with that, and they have funds in their I know they contract that. the ones they clean. They just that term, but those they clean are the ones that are the common historic ones. They're the older stones. Okay. It's not, if there's current family members maintaining the family's responsibility to have the stones clean. But these are the ones that have been there for over 100 years, and there's nobody left to look after them. And the volunteers don't do it. So yeah. they hired oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And I could be wrong, but I believe that they when they sell a lot, I believe a portion is for the lot and a portion's for perpetual and perpetual 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 fund. To, so they collect money to yeah. help. Oh, okay. All right. They should have endowment yeah. funds, investment funds that they put these perpetual funds in to uh, generate income so that they can keep operating. Is it, does that money, is that under the uh, budget heading for the town? No, or is the it, town does not have theirs. that. That's the association's money. Okay. Um, and I was wondering um, about, I know uh, the paving was done on Randolph, and the, you know, I talked to you about the sides, yes. I don't know what they call the shoulders. the shoulders or whatever. Yep. There's sometimes quite a dip yep. there. Um, if anybody's biking on that. Yeah, I mean, Kevin and I actually drove that last week before we, actually Thursday? Thursday. Thursday, before it started raining, and we're talking about getting the, the shoulder work done. So once he gets caught up, we'll get out there and put the shoulder work. Is there any any way a little bike path can be put there on either side of the road? I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's is it too narrow? I think it's too narrow. And we'd be cutting down loose material that wouldn't be packed, so the regular road bikes wouldn't like it at all. Hmm. All right. I just want, I was going to do a public service announcement that there's going to be a presentation at the library on Sunday at two o'clock. Um, films going to be showed about homelessness, and there's going to be a panel discussion. So, just making a. I, I'm not doing it, <laughs> but just a public announcement for that. Thank you. Okay. I'm No, we're collecting money. Well, my 11 year old's collecting money. <laughs> um, but nothing's really been moving forward. We're still at the collecting money stage. Okay. Right. No, I just want to say happy birthday. But I want everybody to know it's his birthday. <laughs> what number? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 55. Mm -hmm. Double nickels. <laughs> this is exactly what I wanted to do on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be a better place. Surrounded by friends. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to thank, thank our road crews. That's amazing. Not just road crews, but our emergency services. When we have a, an event like this last one came, and I think uh, it kind of took us all by surprise. I know it did some towns. But our, our resources here are unreal, you know, it's, it's great. Police, rescue, fire, highway, it's awesome. I can tell you that not just us were caught off guard, the state was caught off guard. It was horribly under forecasted, mm -hmm. which is the nature of, of meteorology. But they had predicted as much as two inches of rain. And a gentleman on McKinstry Hill is an official uh, collecting data. And he had five and a quarter inches of rain wow. in 18 hours. Yep. Wow. So How many hours? 18. Wow. And then the wind came. Yeah. So it was an extraordinary event. And uh, the governor's has said it's the, the worst one we've had since Irene. Not comparing it to Irene, but the worst one we've had yeah. since then. I believe it. 
No, too bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I don't think we mentioned electric department too. Right. That's a good point. All right. Next. Any other business? Always. Sarah. Danny. So, um, thank you to all the road crew and everything for the storm. I would like to actually back up a few hours and say thank you to um, the highway department and the police department and everybody for Halloween because their night really started earlier and I went out trick-or-treating with my children in the pouring rain and the guys were just standing out there and keeping our street scene uh, safe for our youth and I just want to say thank you as parents mm -hmm. standing in the rain for our the children of our community. Did they pass out candy too? They didn't and they wouldn't take candy from me either. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Come on. Oh. They go to my street. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, that was a short night after about yeah. 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 yeah, thanks again, you guys. Danny. I got a call about some people hanging out at the pavilion down there with band show, and you want to call it on the phone. Just stop plugged in. Have you guys disconnected the power to that building yet? And are you going to? It's just something that we've. You know, we've never disconnected it before, so it's, it's up to the board. Or... Well, what I understand with the space heaters that were in there, the people that were in there, I really don't want to go drag out a body because that place is burning. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they did a call from PD, and I had talked to Andy, and he was dealing with part of it down there and he had unplugged everything and asked them not to plug nothing in. I didn't know if there was a way that we could shut the power off of that during the winter. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there people using that resource to stay warm? Yep. Yep. Stay warm and add something else in there they were using to cook. So I'm going to go with it. Well, I mean, the chief was I know the PD been down there. Yeah. You know, Mon, I've been, we've been Mon. down there. We've been down there. Yeah, they called Denny because I was concerned <laughs> for her. So. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. I was at the Oxbow after I had been here approximately 3 o'clock this afternoon. And on the stones in the parking lot next to the van shell were two big full trash barrels. Uh, a, a grill uh, and a few other odds and ends piled. It looks like somebody had cleaned the place out and stacked it next to the parking lot. I don't know if anybody here did it, whether the police did it, or anybody cleared that up. But it looked like, it looked like the material from inside, if it was from inside, uh, was already removed and put out. Of the Quote unquote curb. So somebody might want to check that first thing in the morning and see if they have them. I just don't know. They were cooking in there a week or two ago. What well, it was brought up at the recreation um, meeting the possibly uh, somehow closing off the, the, the band shell during the winter. We better investigate it a little more. What's going on? And the PD's been down there, you know, on a regular basis, monitoring to see what's going on. Um, there's a population that does go down there to get out of the weather. So how much of a job is it to shut the power? Probably not much at all, but I just want to make sure that everybody, that's what everybody wants me to do. Unfortunately, well, nice to have uh, the folks that are using it get some resources. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We're not fixing the problem displacing it. I can tell you that the. Uh, the high Park, mm -hmm. that house will about, I believe, it's the 14th or 15th of November. Mm -hmm. It'll be open for winter. Mm -hmm. Where they're going to be hours and see the hours, one hour, so to keep them warm. But uh, that's, that's what's been going on down there, I believe. Yeah. I know the chief is paying attention to that, too, yeah. you know, when that shelter's been open. And that's when she shut it off. <coughs> It is a complex up. problem. There's no question about that. And when you close that van shell or start doing enforcement action, you're simply going to move the problem somewhere else. 
I don't know what you do. Well, well there's, a, there's a, the program going on, on on Sunday at the library. It might be a good chance for people to come and see what possibilities are there. And he's absolutely right. Sooner or later, there's going to be an accident there in town as well. It's just a fact of the, of the problem. What time is that program at the library? It's at 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. 15. Okay. Publication time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like shut it down. Not, not to do with the people, but it's, I think it's a liability. They're going to set a fire down there. Not only maybe somebody get hurt, it's going to you know, turn the potential down. And again, I hope they can get their resources where they. Well, I don't know if they can get into resources if the yes. resources are available. Yeah. So, right. PD's kind of our main line on that one. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? Uh, I move to find that premature don't fully knowledge of defending the problem of civil litigation, which the public body is or maybe the party will clearly place the time to substantial disadvantage by disposing of the jurisdiction of the tribe. No. I move we have an executive session to discuss the accounts and practical agreements with the police union and pending litigation on the provision of Title I, Section 3, Section 1. Okay. Just leave I heard that too. I didn't think so. I'm here to say aye.